Hello and welcome to this event from the Center on Regulation and Markets at the Brookings Institution. My name is Sandra Patnak and I'm the director of the center. We are now uh, at the beginning of a revolution in artificial intelligence that will have impacts across many industries and most parts of our life. Today we are, uh, ha have wonderful experts together for an event to see how AI might impact labor policy and the workforce because we already start, are starting to see disruptions in the workforce and in different markets across the world. Two of those industries that have been already part of the bellwether industries, so to, so to speak, where we do see impact of AI already play an important role has been the industry of actors and the writers, where we have seen both of these groups strike over the summer and now this, uh, both, both strikes have been resolved. And one part of the issues was AI, where uh, there was a big debate about how AI would be used by studios, how it could potentially replace actors and what safeguards that will be put in place to protect employees and workers. And we, we expect to see a lot of the same debates in many other industries as soon as AI and more automated systems become available and more advanced. And so today we have a wonderful group of experts here. We're going to start off with a fireside chat with Duncan Crabtree Ireland, who is the National Executive Director and Chief Negotiator of SAG AFTRA. That's the world's largest and most influential entertainment union, which has more than 160,000 members. And uh, he was a lead negotiator now to end the strike with the Actors Union. And the fireside chat will be moderated by our non resident fellow, Lonnie Mahanta. Over to you, Lonnie. Duncan, thank you so much for um, chatting with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, could you maybe start with telling us a little bit about your background, uh, what brought you to SAG-AFTRA, um, and the role that you played in the recent negotiations? Oh, sure. Um, well, first of all, I've been here at SAG-AFTRA and previously at Screen Actors Guild since 2000. So this, later this month will be my 23rd anniversary working here. So I spent the majority of my career working with this union and on behalf of actors and performers that we represent. Prior to that, I, it's a very weird career path because prior to that, I was a criminal prosecutor oh. in the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office. So I kind of transitioned from criminal prosecution into the entertainment, uh, into the entertainment business. But my background is as a lawyer, but uh, I've been our uh, national executive director and chief negotiator since 2021. And um, so in that capacity, I was the, the lead negotiator for this contract. And so that basically involves working with our member led committee uh, and with our really talented negotiation staff to essentially oversee all aspects of preparing for carrying out this negotiation in the strike. Okay. We'll get into AI more specifically in a moment, but could you just share maybe at a high level the main issues that sag wanted to address um, in the strike and really how the strike came to be? Yeah, I mean, obviously we started out with negotiations, so we began preparing last December, so it's been almost mm -hmm. a year since we started preparing for this negotiation. Our negotiations formally started on June 7th, and in our proposal package, we were really trying to address a number of issues, but the key ones, like you said, AI has been at the top of the list since the very beginning. We also were seeking to address the impact that inflation has had on our members' minimum earnings over the last few years, as I think we all we all know, we've all experienced that. And so we were looking for significant increases in minimum rates so that our members would not uh, fall behind and be earning less in real dollar terms than they were before. Uh, we also, of course, were seeking to address the change in the business that's come out of this development of streaming. And so over the last decade, as streaming has become more and more significant in the overall scope of the entertainment business and the area that our members work in, it's really caused havoc on actors' abilities to just have a middle-class lifestyle and make a living. And it, the short version is that's because seasons have shrunk dramatically. If you remember back in the days of peak broadcast television, most television series would shoot 22 to 26 episodes a season. Most streaming series shoot between eight to 10 episodes a season. Mm. And instead of having a season every calendar year, a lot of times those streaming series will have a season and then be, be on hiatus for 18 to 24 to 36 months between. So you can imagine if you're getting paid on an episode basis, way fewer episodes, and that has to cover a way longer period of time, that is a huge crunch. So we were really looking, uh, and our contracts really hadn't evolved to keep up with that hmm. um, because the companies hadn't been willing to do that. So we were looking to, to do something to change the stream of revenue that would come in so that actors working and streaming could make a, a decent middle-class living. And 
you know, continue to pursue that as a career. A whole bunch of other detailed items, things like improving our benefit plan contributions and things that were specific to different categories of performers. But that's uh, that's sort of a broad, a broad based overview of some of the things that we were focused on. Okay, that's really helpful. I feel like we could have a whole separate conversation about streaming <laughs> and all the issues on that side. Good, for sure. Um, so, you know, I think everybody that's tuning in today and many of us, we uh, recognize that AI is likely to touch all, most, if not all industries in some way in the future, but specifically in the entertainment industry, how is AI being used? Um, is How is it being used today? How might it be used in the future? You know, are these issues that are you're just anticipating what's to come or are these things that are already happening now? Yeah, these are things that are happening now. And I think that's one of the reasons why our negotiation ended being ended up being the most difficult probably on AI mm -hmm. of any of the ones that have happened so far. And the provisions that we've achieved in this negotiation are far more extensive and detailed than any that we've seen so far from any other union. And that's because AI technology is already being used and has been used to create digital replicas of actors. And I mean, you can think of some very prominent examples such as, you know, Carrie Fisher and Star Wars mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, Paul Walker and the Fast and Furious movie, et cetera. And while to date that's mostly been done with fairly high profile performers when there is a unavailability, for example, if someone's passed away or for some other reason, they're unavailable. It's really clear that that technology is moving in a direction where it's going to be used more in a more widespread way because of the decreased cost and increased efficiency of, of using those tools. And so we really, you know, that is a current concern and a current problem like right now. And that's one of the reasons why we had to have this AI issue dealt with in this negotiation. We couldn't wait three years till our next contract cycle had to be dealt with now. Um, in terms of looking to the future, um, what we obviously are concerned about is the growing use of generative AI, in particular, the idea of creating uh, synthetic, what we would call synthetic fakes or synthetic performers, where they're essentially attempting to create a person that doesn't really exist and have them take the place of a real person's job and you know which is a, a big concern obviously from mm -hmm. a labor union perspective but also just as a human being as someone who cares about culture you know what the impact of taking human creativity out of the cultural marketplace would really mean for our society so there's a great concern there and so we tried to balance those things and we have provisions in this agreement that deal with both we have very very strong and specific provisions about digital replication of actors, mm -hmm. making sure that they have a right of informed consent so that they know what's going to be done with any kind of digital double that's created of them. And also they have a right to fair compensation for that. And then on the generative AI front, really trying to make sure that we know what it is the companies are doing, that we have a right to negotiate for compensation for that where it occurs, and that in certain specific types of uses that there's an individual right of consent. Uh, for our members whose images or, you know, facial features, for example, might be used as part of that. So I view it as a long-term work in progress because we're going to have to continue working on AI as we go forward. But I think mm -hmm. what we fought for and achieved in this negotiation and the strike that it took to get there uh, really were key provisions to ensure that people, our members could be comfortable that there are enough guardrails that they can move forward in this business and, and not risk the loss of control of their own persona. Yeah. I mean, these are just like critically important um, issues that you guys are sort of the first ones to really, I think, deal with this on a widespread basis right now. One of the things that I saw, you know, you you put out in the midst of the strike was talking about AI as a mandatory um, subject of bargaining. Can you explain for all of us listening here about, you know, why it was important to call out AI as a mandatory subject of bargaining, what that means? Sure, because I mean, the reason it was so important to us is because the, some companies in the business and in the entertainment industry had started sort of moving forward and doing certain things without actually talking to the union about it before they did it. And, you know, for anyone who's familiar with sort of how labor law and labor relations works, when you're doing something that affects somewhat, you know, unionized uh, workplaces, terms and conditions of employment, that's something that has to be discussed with the union. And so in uh, several of those cases, we were satisfied with the way the companies had voluntarily mm -hmm. chosen to proceed. And so we didn't end up needing to make a big, uh, you know, big dispute out of it. But we did need to make it clear to the industry that, um, and to anyone, to everyone, that these types of implementation, implementation of AI, creating digital replicas, using them in place of performers, 
that is something that affects the terms and conditions of employment for our members. And so um, they really cannot do that without negotiating terms with the union, which they have now done as part of this agreement. And so long as they're in compliance uh, with those terms, then then everything will be good. And But I can assure you, there's so much energy behind this that any kind of idea that people are going to turn this into a wild, wild west situation or just kind of go off and do whatever they want, um, you know, will be monitoring that and reacting to it in a very vigilant manner. Yeah. You walked through some of the terms. I was just wondering if we could like dig in a little bit more. Um, I'm curious just about some of the specifics around AI. um, And then, yeah, I'll follow up after you kind of start there. Yeah, sure. So for AI, <clears throat> the first thing we started with, as I mentioned, was digital replication, because mm-hmm. that's something that's really happening now. And AI tools have already been used for it and are going to be used even more so in this direction in the near future. And so um, the fundamental principles that we wanted to enshrine were this principle of informed consent, meaning that it's not just a boilerplate consent provision. It is actually something where the performer knows what the intended use of the digital replica is. So the days of like putting a line in on 12 page of a contract, that's uh, page 12 of a contract that says, uh, I give you permission to just use my digital replica in perpetuity throughout the universe for any purpose now known or ever ever conceived. That's not going to work. What has to happen is, and this is in the contract language, is that there has to be a reasonably specific description of the intended use. So they've got to say, you know, we're going to use your digital replica to... Um, handle reshoots in this scenario. We're going to use your digital replica to do this particular scene. They're going to need to tell the performer what they're going to do with the digital replica. And then the performer can say yes or no to that. Um, That's the fundamental concept. And that's enshrined in this agreement, both for digital replicas that are created as part of their direct employment on a project, as well as for digital replicas that a producer might uh, license in from a third party or from the performer themselves. So really the, the the number one through line in this is informed consent and that people should have the right, in our case, our members should have the right to say yes or no to someone creating something that uses their image and likeness and makes it appear as if they have done or said something. Okay. Then on top of that, there's this concept of fair compensation. We have a, uh, you know, and I don't know how in the weeds we want to get, but there is a metric that's built into this contract in terms of how to measure appropriate compensation when a digital replica does work instead of a instead of the person themselves. Mm-hmm. And that's for projects where the person is employed. And then on projects where that replica is licensed in, like I mentioned, mm-hmm. in that scenario, there'll be a negotiation over what the appropriate compensation is for that. And so that's like to- a specific negotiation with the performer with the performer as part of securing their as part of securing their consent to the use of that digital replica then there will be a compensation discussion for certain types of performers there's a minimum uh, mm-hmm. which is based on our scale minimum or daily minimum rate for actors uh, for other performers who are typically paid at a higher level of compensation there's a negotiation process that happens there um, and but 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 there's a clear expectation that there's compensation for that for that use. And I wanna make it just as a side note, um, a lot of people don't often think about background actors, but background actors are an important part of our membership. And even though you might not know their names, uh, without them, a lot of projects would be, wouldn't be the same. They couldn't go forward without that human component. And so our provisions also protect background actors in the same way, uh, slightly different mechanism, but in the same conceptual way as it does for principal performers. And actually guarantees that the companies will continue to hire human background actors to fill the covered positions of background acting on these projects. So I think there's quite a lot there. It's a it's an extensive provision, uh, runs to maybe it's like 15 pages or so uh, in the contract. And so it's uh, there's a lot, there's a lot there, but I think there's a reason there's a lot there, which is it, this is a new area as our president, Fran Drescher, likes to say, you know, we started from a blank page here. We didn't have any provisions in the contract mm-hmm. regarding AI, other than with the sole exception of we did have provisions regarding digital replication of nude scenes. But other than that, we didn't have any AI related or digital replication provisions. So these had to be negotiated from scratch. And this is uh, really groundbreaking for that reason, because it puts a whole host of protections into place that didn't exist before. Very much so. 
you covered a lot. You <laughs> sorry, I went, start, no, I went no, no, no. I mean, on there great. for a while, didn't I? Sorry about no, that. No, no, no. I mean, like <laughs> the negotiations, what you were able to cover was significant. Oh, okay. are there <laughs> are there are there any issues that you hoped to cover but were unable to kind of get to um, on this round of bargaining? Not so much that we that we hoped to cover, but we didn't get to. But yeah, there are definitely issues we had hoped to get some movement from the companies on some uh, some improvements mm-hmm. in that we weren't able to achieve even after being on strike for you know almost 120 days um and for example uh we really do need improvements in uh, meal penalties and rest periods these are mm-hmm. basic working conditions concerns that have to do with making sure people get adequate rest so that they can be safe and also you know just as a human being people should have a chance to have a have lunch or eat something during the course of their workday. And the provisions in the contract are really antiquated uh, in those areas, and we'll definitely have to return to them. But when we looked at the overall big picture, the most important priorities uh, in this contract, we were able to achieve uh, results on. And of course, in any negotiation, you don't get everything that you want. Right. Uh, that That's true in AI. It's true in all of the provisions. Uh, we had to compromise in certain areas. But Ultimately, we um, held firm, and that's why we were on strike for so long. We held firm to getting a minimum standard of protection that we felt was fair and respectful to our members, and that's what this contract now represents, and I'm extremely proud of it. Now that you are seeking ratification from the rest of the the union members, um, and some of the deal terms are public, um, we've seen a few folks that have raised concerns about the proposal and some of the terms around AI. Uh, I saw a few people kind of suggesting that AI shouldn't be permitted at all. What's your response to that? You know, is it possible to kind of stop technological advancement in that way? I mean, that's that is the that is the real problem with that. I mean, uh, obviously, there are people, plenty of people who would probably like to see AI not exist or just frozen in place. I mean, you might remember there was a moment in time a little while ago when I think it was Elon Musk who sort of <clears throat> said to everyone, we should all just put a, a freeze on AI development for six months. Um, and you could see where that went, which is exactly nowhere. I mean, even he and his companies, much less anybody else, didn't stop development of AI technology in response to that. So our strategy has been, you know, well, there's really two choices of strategy, right? One is let's just try to block this technology and stop it. And another is let's acknowledge it's going to happen and let's figure out how we can channel it. I don't think you can really do both because if your energy is directed at stopping it, then if you don't succeed in stopping it, then you will have missed your window to influence its direction. And so our strategic decision was to try and influence its direction, not to try and stop it. And that's because past history shows you can't actually stop it. You know, more than someone could stop the industrial revolution or someone could stop the development of the internet. That's not, that's not, that's not feasible. So whether whether people like AI or don't like AI really isn't the question because we don't have the ability to stop AI. What we do have the ability to do is to use all the influence and leverage we can build up to put guardrails around how it's implemented in the industries we're responsible for, to you know channel it in a direction that can be more towards augmentation and less towards replacement of people, and to ultimately have it help lift people up instead of tearing them down. And so that was our strategic approach. So I, I acknowledge all the people who say, we wish there weren't AI, we'd like to stop AI. Um, I can guarantee you, we couldn't have stopped AI no matter how long we would have stayed on strike. Mm-hmm. So what we did do is achieve, I think, really strong protections. Um, and are they perfect? No. I mean, there are people who criticize these protections and say, it should be this, it should be that, et cetera. In any kind of negotiation like this, you have to find the balance. You have to ensure you get what you really need. But we did stay on strike for 118 days. We pushed our leverage to the max. I personally believe we selected the right moment to make a deal. I believe it was our moment of maximum leverage. I think that leverage would not have increased from us remaining on strike longer. And um, I believe we achieved the best possible deal that could have been achieved in connection with AI um, in this negotiation. Mm. I think that there's a lot of what you've covered here that's sort of talking about, you know, the role of SAG-AFTRA, the union in negotiations, specifically in the entertainment industry. But you started this conversation off by also just talking about hot labor summer and sort of where that's gone. And, you know, we've seen a huge increase in u- in union activity in recent years. Um, you know, what do you think? What what What's the reason for that? Why have we seen this increased action? Well, you know, I I think it's because people, well, I think I think it's because companies kind of went 
a step too far. You know, the sort of consolidation of companies, the growing power of the corporate world, um, and its impact on workers has really passed the tipping point to where workers are highly motivated to say, this doesn't feel right. This doesn't feel sustainable. We've got to do something. And the only tool that's proved to be a reliable way to balance out the power imbalance between big corporate employers and workers is organized labor. I mean, sure, there's all kinds of regulatory structures and things like that, but there is not the level of nuance in, in policymaking to be able to address the kinds of concerns that a lot of workers have. And that's, in my view, why you've seen, you know, the this wide range of labor activism develop over the last couple of years, whether it's on the organizing level at Amazon and Starbucks, et cetera, mm-hmm. or whether it's in the contract negotiations level, like at UPS and 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 then the the big car makers and of course us and the writers guild. And so I think um, one of the things that will come out of all of this is, I think, especially the strike here in Hollywood, the reason why it's been important beyond this industry is it has gotten a lot of attention from people out in the country who really are like, wow, workers can stand up for themselves and actually achieve change. And I think the more that message gets out there and the more people realize there is power in collective action, whether it's through a formal union or some other method, um, that that can really be a force for good and to help balance things out in our country. The the you know economic and other imbalances in this country have been moving in the wrong direction. And I hope both through the labor movement and in other ways that we're able to help sort of correct that and achieve a more just and legitimate balance. I think it's better for our country overall. And I think unions are going to play a big part in that. So I'm I'm proud to have been a small part of the hot labor summer. And I think it's going to continue. You know, I think we're going to see this continuing over coming years because the truth is it works. These trends are, you, you, you can't deny them, right? These things, these are things that are happening. And I'm so curious to see what role AI will continue to play in the increased um, collective action that we're seeing across many different industries. You know, I know AI is central to what's happening in the entertainment industry right now, but do you think that AI will play a role in spurring further collective action in the broader economy? Absolutely, it will, I think. I mean, a few years ago, we at SAG-AFTRA have been attending CES, the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas, for more than 20 years. And our intent was to try and see technological changes and advances before they actually hit so that we could be prepared for them. And a few years ago, um, we invited the AFL-CIO and some other unions to come join us at CES because in, in our observation there, we had been saying, you know, more unions ought to be here seeing what is happening from a technological mm-hmm. perspective. And it's not just entertainment unions. I mean, the first year we did that, we had the local unions from Unite here, the hotel and restaurant employees come with us. And one of the things that was on display was uh, one of the major, I won't name them, one of the major electronics companies put together an entirely uh, robotic kitchen and restaurant, right? No humans whatsoever from the kitchen to the dishwashing to the serving of food to customers. And I think something like that really opens your eyes to how this kind of technology isn't just in one part of the industry. It's not just affecting one type of worker. This can affect everybody and all of us. And it has real, really significant implications. So I think this is going to be a a big conversation. And I think to the point you asked earlier, such an insightful point about mandatory subject to bargaining, because one of the things, just one example of how having union representation can really help workers is in our case, where members of SAG-AFTRA were asked to sign consents to be scanned for the creation of a digital replica before these contract provisions have been negotiated, we can confidently tell them, whatever you sign doesn't matter because this is part of your employment under this labor agreement. And it's going to be controlled by how we negotiate it, not if an employer put together an overreaching release form and had you sign it. Somebody who's working outside the scope of that union protection doesn't have that, doesn't have that to help them. They're on their own. And so I think the more people feel like, you know, dealing with these big companies on our own is not beneficial to us because we get taken advantage of. I think that will just further drive um, an approach to this, a a collective approach, which can be done in a way that really um, helps balance out those those power imbalances. So I'm, I'm eager to see that continue. And I know we'll be doing our part to help support other unions who've got their negotiations and their organizing campaigns coming up in the next couple of years. I know. And I'm so curious to see if 
workers, especially that are in industries or sectors that are not currently unionized, if the fear of the AI of replacement of jobs, if that starts to happen in certain segments, if that's going to kind of bring the labor movement into industries that, you know, in the recent past have not been formally organized, it'll be. That's a, I mean, I think, I think you're absolutely right that it definitely will do that. And, you know, I think one of the things that scholars, you know, particularly, uh, you know, people like Brookings and and scholars who are really thinking about the implications of AI on the broader on the broader economy and on workers. Uh, you know, universal basic income is something people have talked about for a long time. But I have this feeling that the implementation of AI on a broader basis is going to bring that topic right back up to the forefront, because in a world where we are having labor replaced or impacted dramatically by these kinds of technology tools, we've got to do something to address the impacts on, on society. And if we're going to create all these great additional efficiencies and, you know, enable corporate environments to, to, you know, to uh, juice their earnings through this technology, then maybe there is something we need to do to help address the impacts that it has on actual people. I mean, after all, that's why we're all here, right? You know, you have common ground there with OpenAI's founder, Sam Altman, who has been really interested and focused on universal basic income as a, as a component of what's going to happen with large shifts from AI. Um, and this actually takes a perfect segue to just curious about some of your thoughts around AI and the political process. Um, so, you know, do you see members and leaders of the labor movement, such as yourself and others in SAG-AFTRA, taking part in the political conversation around regulating AI? Oh, absolutely. In fact, we we have a bill that we helped conceive that is in Congress right now called uh, the No AI Frauds Act. Mm. And it is specifically designed to try and address the challenge of AI tools being used to create unauthorized digital replicas of people, not only actors, although obviously it's affected our membership greatly. I mean, I've had so many of our members who've been abused by deep fakes and especially deep fake pornography, things mm. like that. But also um, just, you know, there is this real risk that without a public policy uh, guardrail as well, that, you know, we'll we'll be able to take care of what we need to within the industry through negotiations. But these outside parties also need to have some rules of the road, too. And so we've got legislation in Congress for that. We've got legislation. We've done legislation in the past um, on these issues in New York and California. We've got a bill in California right now addressing proper consent for the use of digital replication. So we're definitely going to be very, very engaged in the public policy sphere as it relates to AI, especially because I think our members are some of the first people to really deeply feel the effects of generative AI coming. Yeah. And we want to make sure that that is accounted for. And maybe maybe our government can actually you know, get regulation in place in a timely manner to help make sure that these effects don't go completely bonkers. I know. Let's hope that the government and the Biden administration's involvement in AI at a relatively early stage means that we'll have a different approach to regulating technology sort of in a way that allows innovation, but is also protective of people of our society and, you know, our the important norms in a way that maybe we didn't see in prior versions of um, tech innovation. So we'll see. We'll see what happens there. <laughs> that would be great. And I, I was really <laughs> encouraged that they did issue the executive order they did. And I was even further encouraged to see that the role of workers was directly reflected in that executive order. I think um, there would have been times in the past where that wouldn't have occurred. And I think recognizing there is an important role for the Department of Labor and for people who care about workers as part of the AI conversation, it's not just a tech conversation, it's also a human yeah. conversation. Yeah, and I think that what you said about this being an immediate impact for your members right now is really important. It makes it concrete and it helps policymakers understand in a much more tangible and visceral way, like what we're talking about with generative AI and how that impacts people. Um, yeah, yeah, agreed. Yeah. Well, I think we're running up on time here. Is there anything else that you wanted to kind of share with us um, as we wrap up? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would just say, you know, one of the things I always like to mention, because when people think about SAG-AFTRA, a lot of times they think about some of our most famous and well-known members. And obviously, that's a big that's a part of our membership, and we were very fortunate to have their support in helping get our issues out to the public and helping explain things, et cetera. But this strike really wasn't about, and this contract negotiation wasn't about uh, celebrities or high-profile performers. This 
negotiation was primarily focused on protecting everyone from AI, from background actors to the most successful performers, but also from an economic point of view, really trying to um, recalibrate so that middle-class, middle-income working actors could continue to make a living and have a career as creative professionals. And that's something I think every everyone in the creative industry is fighting for. It's a real challenge right now. And so, you know, this is part of being in the labor movement and part of the workers' struggle is to make sure that as these economic changes occur, uh, that there is a fairness and balance to it that keeps uh, keeps careers and livelihoods sustainable. So I'm pretty proud to have been a part of that. Wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Really appreciate great. it. Thanks, Lonnie. It was great. Thank you. Appreciate All it. Right. Take care. Thank you very much, uh, Loni, for this uh, and Duncan for this fantastic uh, um, uh, discussion. Let me just get into the second part of uh, uh, the program. We're going to have uh, a nice and uh, interesting uh, panel. Um, my name is Alberto Rossi. I'm a professor of finance at Georgetown, when I'm also the director of the AI Analytics and Future Work Initiative, and I'm a visiting fellow at Brookings. Uh, we have uh, two fantastic panels with, our, with us, so let me start by introducing them. We have uh, Stephanie Bell. Uh, Stephanie is a senior research scientist with the AI, labor, and economy team at Partnership on AI. She helped draft the partnership's guidelines for AI and shared prosperity, which contains responsible practices for AI developers and uh, AI using organizations to ensure the design, development, and implementation of AI upholds worker well-being and creates shared prosperity. In her research, she's particularly interested in finding ways to include the perspectives of uh, frontline workers in AI development and exploring how AI can create better opportunities for low, low wage workers. Uh, prior to joining Partnership on AI, Stephanie was an engagement manager with McKinsey and Company. She holds a doctor, phil uh, doctor in philosophy in politics and a master in philosophy um, in uh, development studies from the University of Oxford, and she also holds a BA in anthropology from the University of Chicago. Thank you, Stephanie, for being with us. Thank you for having me. And uh, we have uh, the second panelist is uh, Anton Korinik. Anton is a professor at the University of Virginia, both the economics department and uh, the business school. Um, he's a, a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution, a research associate at uh, MBR, a research fellow at CPR, and uh, the economics of AI lead at the Center uh, for the Governance of AI. He received his uh, PhD from Columbia University in 2007 and has worked at Johns Hopkins, University of Maryland, as well as at policy institutions such as the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, Anton's research uh, analyzes how to prepare for a world of transformative AI systems. He investigates the implication of uh, advanced AI for economic growth, labor market inequality, and uh, uh, the future of our society. And uh, before diving into questions, uh, I would like to ask uh, Anton and Stephanie to share some introductory remarks uh, with the audience. Why don't we start with um, uh, Anton? Thank you, Alberto. We are in some sense all actors today. And I don't mean that in the Shakespearean sense that you know all the world is a stage, but in the sense that the job threats from AI that the actors can feel very tangibly these days affect us all. Uh, now, as we could hear from Duncan, the actor's strike was caused by several factors, by wages that have not caught up with post pandemic inflation, uh, by uh, the new streaming model and the fact that contracts had not caught up with that yet. But the point of the broadest relevance is that all of us, including the screen actors that were on strike, uh, can feel and see the rapid advances in AI that are more automating more and more of what we as workers are doing. And they're doing that at an unprecedented pace. So the negotiations of actors and the issues brought up by advances AI in that context are a harbinger uh, for all of us of what's to come. So thank you, Alberto and Sanchi, for organizing uh, this very topical panel, uh, which has really broad ramifications 
for essentially all workers. And speaking of this unprecedented pace of progress, uh, I want to start uh, with some numbers uh, as an economist to kind of ground our conversation. Uh, and one of the numbers that I have found the most interesting is uh, to look at uh, this rapid advancement in AI uh, by just measuring how much computing power is going into the most advanced AI systems. And uh, there is a, a really kind of mind numbing statistic out there, which is that for the past decade, the amount of computing power going into the most cutting edge AI systems has doubled every six months. It has doubled every six months for more than a decade. So it means it quadruples every year. And on top of that, we are also making algorithmic progress, which means that that computing power is used ever more efficiently. And if you combine the two, there are some estimates that the effective computing power of the most advanced AI systems is actually going up by a factor of 10 every year. And there is no end in sight to that. Uh, it is almost certainly going to continue for the next three years, most likely at least five years and potentially much longer than that. And at the end of that period, AI systems uh, will have absorbed far more computing power than what our brains uh, can fetch in terms of computing power. So, um, what has happened in the past 12 or 18 months is not that there was any fundamental break in this continuous progress, in this continuous doubling every six months that we have seen for more than a decade already. But what has happened is that on this exponential growth curve, it seems we have suddenly crossed the threshold where generative AI can be broadly useful and can be broadly useful for a whole range of creative works uh, can be useful uh, for uh, motion picture companies who want to spin up artificial actors, uh, but can also be useful for any other type of cognitive work, uh, whether that is uh, writers, uh, copy editors, uh, even economists like myself, uh, who see that a growing number of the things that we do in our daily work are suddenly being automated. So um, the current negotiations uh, of uh, the Actors' Union are completed. But what I also want to emphasize that in the long term, there are still very strong economic forces uh, for creating synthetic actors. And I'm not speaking of replica of existing actors, uh, for which I think uh, actors have very strong protections now uh, in the latest agreement. Uh, but I mean, synthetic actors that are just created out of nowhere, that are fully uh, generated, that have uh, no necessary resemblance uh, of existing people. And that may perhaps be the superstars of tomorrow. Today, all the superstars are humans, uh, but we can already see there are some social media stars that are not actually real people uh, and that are generated almost entirely by bots. And uh, I think there is a significant risk uh, that the actors of tomorrow, including the superstars among actors of tomorrow, uh, may also be uh, fully synthetic and even if all the parties uh, of the current union agreement uh, refrain from doing this and are perhaps uh, banned from doing this through the agreement, there would still be new entrants who would do this because it would be economically just so tempting and potentially uh, so profitable. So um, in short, uh, I just want to emphasize that uh, there is progress in AI is proceeding really fast. And it's very hard to predict how soon the type of world that I just described will materialize. Uh, and I guess uh, the best advice when you're facing a lot of uncertainty is to be ready for all kinds of scenarios. 
And uh, that's uh, what I also want to advocate in this context. We need to be prepared for a range of scenarios uh, for how AI will continue to affect labor uh, in the coming years and decades. And one possibility is that this role as it is right now will still roughly be the same in 10 years from now, in 20 years from now. But I think there could also be more cataclysmic changes that we need to start preparing for. And I look forward to discussing that in more detail uh, for the rest of the next half hour. Thank you very much, Anton. Uh, what about you, Stephanie? Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you to the Brookings team for having me to join you all on this very important and, Anton, as Anton said, timely conversation. Uh, I completely agree with his comment about the actor's strike and the writer's strike before that uh, as being you know, extremely reflective of the challenges that are going to face so many different segments of the labor market uh, in due time and perhaps a lot sooner than any of us would anticipate. And what I'd love to do actually to start is to take a step back and reflect on the purpose of these technologies, the point of setting them down, their current developmental trajectories. Uh, because these are still all very much human decisions. We are not at a point where AI is developing itself uh, and then making decisions about how it is used. Uh, humans make the decisions about the developmental trajectory of artificial intelligence, uh, and humans are the ones who are deciding how to use it. And so my provocation, my challenge to all of us is to be thinking about how do we use these technologies to build a world that we all are excited to live in? Uh, and I think the trajectory that we're on right now doesn't necessarily reflect that. Uh, there are big concerns about automation, big concerns about the way that augmenting jobs is going to dis displace or disrupt workers, uh, and also major concerns about the way that these technologies are turning up in workplaces are actually degrading uh, the way that we spend our time uh, in our nine to fives if we're lucky or you know, slightly more regular hours if we're less lucky or that's our preference. Uh, these are all big choices that we should be thinking about heavily as a society. We should be thinking about from a governance perspective. Uh, and we shall also should be thinking about from the context of the decisions being made by the producers of these technologies, uh, the designers, and the folks who are putting them into place. Uh, we have the opportunity now, I think, to bring in a wide, wide variety of voices. I think most importantly, workers' voices uh, to help us steer the direction of these technologies. As Duncan said in his comments, this isn't about saying no to AI, full stop. There are plenty of applications of artificial intelligence that workers would actually welcome. Uh, it's about inviting them into that conversation and taking their opinion seriously and empowering them to have influence and make a difference in the direction that these technologies follow. Uh, and so I find it fascinating that when we were having this conversation about the future of work, call it 2016, 2017, uh, before these technologies, uh, before generative AI certainly was on the market, before many AI technologies were on the market, the promise to all of us was that they were supposed to free us up from drudgery, from tasks that we hate doing, uh, from things that are unsafe to ask humans to do uh, in the context of a labor setting. And instead, we're seeing them take place first and foremost, these strikes are happening in industries that people are so excited to participate in. Uh, Hollywood writers, actors, hugely competitive industries that people find tremendous meaning and purpose in, not just as participants, but also as consumers. What does it say about us that we've, we've sent AI down this path rather than any other number of paths that we could have taken as an alternative? I think one of the ways that we find our way back to a future that we all are a lot more excited to participate in is by taking very seriously the voices of workers, uh, unionized or not, uh, and bringing them into that conversation, uh, ensuring that th this is a conversation rather than you know sort of treated as an inevitability of technological progress. Thank you so much, uh, Stephanie, for this uh, introductory remarks. And so the, the first part of uh, this uh, conversation, I'd like to focus it on the current state of AI and its use in, as we are kind of highlighting this, white collar jobs. So we know that uh, uh, we just heard from Duncan Aloni talking about uh, the impact of AI in Hollywood. But if uh, what other industries are facing significant turmoil? And, and more importantly, what is the best way to predict uh, which industries are going to be affected the most? Like, is there a way to understand or uh, to predict which ones are going to be going through the, the major overhaul going forward? Uh, yeah, that's a really interesting question. And uh, if you had asked any economist 
just three years ago, which jobs are the most exposed to automation? They would not have said white collar jobs, but they would have said blue collar jobs due to continued robotization and so on, right? And so right now it clearly is the white collar jobs. And uh, there are jobs that are already almost fully uh, replaced like translators, uh, copy editors are getting there. Uh, there are a lot of uh, writing tasks, uh, journalism, for example, uh, or call service center agents and so on that are threatened uh, to some extent. Uh, but ultimately, uh, if this con trajectory continues at its current pace, I think it's really that every white collar worker will be affected to some extent. And again, it's very hard to predict uh, whether some extent means that we will just do our work completely differently in 10 years from now, or whether a significant fraction of us won't be doing the work we are doing right now anymore. So that's been the big surprise uh, of these new generative AI technologies. I see. And so if we're thinking about in terms uh, of uh, the positions within companies, um, can we uh, kind of think about whether it is going to be more the junior positions or the senior positions, the ones that are going to be more affected? Like kind of can we have a, a kind of guide map for trying to understand uh, what would happen within individual companies? Uh, Stephanie? Yeah, the early evidence that we're seeing indicates that it's both entry level folks, as well as folks who might be understood to be sort of lower skilled within their role relative to other higher performing employees who will see the highest effects of these technologies. Uh, and in some instances, you could view those as highly positive, right? They're a tool that an entry level worker could use to basically level up. Uh, and have the opportunity to have at their fingertips the same knowledge in many ways as somebody who might have been in the role for months, if not years, uh, prior to them joining that organization. Uh, and so you can see that as potentially a positive impact. And um, it creates a couple of problems, though. So the first problem that it could create is the potential to devalue uh, the skills and the time that those other employees have spent in that role. Uh, we all spend time in our careers accumulating human capital. Uh, you know, we talk about this, you know, as economists, as hum accumulating human cap capital. Uh, maybe for lay folks, it's it's in the context of just you know building skills and learning new things and becoming expert at what we do in our roles. Uh, once you're able to bring in these kind of AI co-pilots or AI uh, augmentation systems, that expertise, those skills, that knowledge could be understood as becoming less valuable across the board. You can bring in somebody without all of that, uh, pay them less. And as a result, uh, you're sort of dropping the value of that time that somebody had spent building up all of those skills. The second problem that this can cause is there's a lot of big questions that I've yet to see good answers to about what this means in terms of career development and advancement and training. And how do we think about things like apprenticeship? Uh, which is you know, widely understood to be one of the most effective ways to help people build skills in a professional context. Uh, if you're taking away the sort of entry level rung on the ladder, the first couple of steps uh, up the staircase, uh, how do you train somebody to manage the, the AI? How do you train them to be a good editor of its outputs? How do you train them to collaborate with it effectively? Uh, there's entirely new robust systems that I think we're going to have to develop when it comes to finding ways to equip people with the skills that they need to work with these systems, because it doesn't look like we're going to be able to go through the same path that many of us follow of first you do the thing, right? You build it, you learn how to write it, you learn how to create it, whatever it might be. And then you learn how to edit, you learn how to shape, you know, creative direction, all of those kinds of things. Uh, you jump straight to step two. Uh, that requires, I think, a very different training approach and a very different, uh, I think we'd need to find alternatives to the apprentice, uh, apprenticeship models that we tend to use for especially entry-level jobs. Uh, possible that there's impacts at the senior side of things as well, but so far we haven't seen as much of that in the data. Okay, that's uh, very interesting. So I think that you're touching on a point that I think is uh, uh, very important is uh, that degree of uh, complementarity and substitutability between AI or of AI in, in white collar jobs. So is there some kind of clear research kind of uh, answer to whether these tools are complementary or are substituting individual skills? And 
is the answer kind of uh, conditional on the, the kind of uh, the sophistication of the AI tool? So can we expect this answer to be uh, one today and then maybe changing over the next uh, five to 10 years? I think so. Um, this is indeed the critical question. So if AI complements workers, it means the workers become more valuable. If it substitutes them, it means it can do their job. Their job goes away, their wages are going to decline. And conceptually, that's such a neat distinction. But what I have seen in the most recent empirical research I have looked at, there's, for example, a famous paper, GPTs are GPTs. What they're finding is that the jobs in which some tasks are complemented are exactly the same in which tasks are also substituted. And that means that in practice, it's really hard to tell uh, which is which. Uh, so let's take, for example, programmers. Programmers are highly impacted by these new generative AI tools. Uh, there are estimates that programmers are uh, two and a half times as productive almost as they were just 18 months ago before these tools were out. And that's a really tremendous productivity increase, right? And in some ways, in the short term, at least, it looks like it is uh, complementary to workers, it is augmenting them. Uh, but if this continues and if they are 10 times as productive, uh, well, demand can't go up quite as fast uh, as uh, automation may proceed if it continues on this trajectory. And that means eventually, and I'm saying this with less confidence now than in my short-term prediction, it could very well be a substitute. And uh, exactly, so going, uh, kind of touching, I think this is a kind of a crucial point that uh, kind of the audience may be very interested is the effect on uh, uh, of AI on salaries. Once again, I mean, we have this kind of trade off, right? So they it makes workers more productive at the same time, you have that uh, potentially makes them more replaceable or it kind of reduces the unique skills that individuals may have accumulated on the job over the course of the years. So how should we think about uh, this trade-off? I mean, do we see evidence in uh, the economy where already some jobs are increasing in the salaries or you see salaries decreasing in other functions? Uh, Stephanie? Yeah, one of the places that we've seen this turn up recently, and this is research that I think is pretty hot off the presses from some folks at Washington University in St. Louis, uh, as well as NYU, uh, is that the freelancers market, uh, digital freelancers in particular, has radically softened uh, since the introduction of ChatGPT. Uh, clearly, folks who were looking for a person to help them complete a task, whether that might be graphic design or web development, entry level you know, data entry or entry level coding, uh, they're turning to these tools and seeing if they can get as much as they need out of out of tools like this. Uh, that obviously has huge ramifications for freelancers' wages because there's just less work to go around and people are in the likelihood willing to pay less for it. Uh, we haven't, to my knowledge, seen quite the same degree of impact around more formalized sectors, you know, sort of salaried wages, those kinds of places. But I wouldn't be surprised to see it turning up eventually. Um, really big factor in this is what exactly is going on in terms of the labor share of sort of productivity gains. Uh, and this is where I think we go straight back to the question of unionization. Uh, private sector unions in this country are in single, single digit numbers, uh, which means that the ability of any given person in, you know, let's say a white collar workplace uh, to be able to fight for a higher share as a result of their increased productivity really exists at an individual level, and they don't have a lot of leverage to be able to make that happen for themselves. So even if they're delivering massively increased value for the company as a result of their increased productivity using these tools, they don't see the upside of that so much of the time. This is where I think that there's big opportunities for unions who might be interested in expanding their membership to start going after white collar workers as the next sort of big expansion opportunity. Uh, and alternatively, for employers to start thinking about what does it look like to coordinate more closely with workers? Uh, I think one of the things that we've surprisingly lost track of in the latest generation of AI you know, products and uses 
uh, are the lessons coming out of, for instance, the Toyota production system of the 1970s or lean manufacturing, uh, that workers can be real assets in understanding the best ways to apply tools, identifying problems within processes and delivering value for the company and by extension shareholders. So rather than seeing this as necessarily an adversarial situation, there's opportunities for workers' wages to expand as well as for companies' bottom lines to expand simultaneously, provided they're savvy about it. And uh, yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that uh, I think it's kind of very important for us to understand is uh, the fact that you know all these AI system they are kind of they're based or they're trained on the kind of full body of knowledge that was produced, right? So because they are doing so effectively, they are uh, using information or the output that the labor has produced over the past, and the same way that they are exploiting the intellectual property of those people that wrote the articles, the books, the posts that uh, have been uh, training this algorithm. So. How do we, what, what is the, the status regarding the, our understanding of how intellectual property is preserved in, uh, in a world of AI? Like, are these uh, tools uh, kind of uh, infringing intellectual property, for example? Are they infringing on uh, the fact that individuals are not uh, kind of uh, being compensated for the previous outputs of their labor that is now being used to train these algorithms? Yeah, I, so I'm not a lawyer, so please don't take anything I have to say here as an actual indication of how some of these cases might actually turn out. Uh, but I would say at the level of principle that it seems obvious that our entire system is designed around the idea that people should be able to market the outputs of their labor uh, and be appropriately compensated for that effort. And certainly what somebody would need as compensation uh, if they were effectively putting themselves out of a job by contributing to a system is a substantially higher level than what they'd receive if it's, you know, just a stock image that's being reproduced in some, you know, publishing outlet somewhere. Uh, the question, of course, is how do you figure out how to do that at scale? Because the value really comes in aggregate rather than sort of individual pieces of data or contributions into the training models. Um, on the other hand, we seem like we've discovered how to do this pretty well with commodity products. A drop of oil isn't worth anything. A substantial amount of oil is. How do we think about potentially creating things like data trusts or data pools that would enable people to kind of collectively take uh, ownership as well as receive compensation for their contributions here? Um, some folks who are undoubtedly smarter than I am are working on this. Um, I look forward to seeing what their results are because I think it's going to become an incredibly pressing issue. Uh, as we try and figure out how to navigate these challenges and also to be able to use these frankly powerful and exciting technologies uh, in ways that really respect people's creative outputs and compensate them for their labor and you know treat them as the professionals that they are. Uh, and I think I'll, I'll say is just a potential expansion on that point that we see the same thing happening, not just in creative industries, but also in the context of places like warehouses or other places where you know motion capture technology is installed. You know, previously, if you had a particularly effective way of accomplishing some task and you were much more efficient than your coworkers at figuring out how to get something done, uh, that gets recognized by management, that gets compensated. Uh, you get a bonus, uh, maybe a promotion, some kind of reward uh, for making that contribution to your company. Uh, and right now, the way that that's playing out is that all of that data, you know, gets sucked into the algorithm, so to speak. Uh, it's not attributed to a single individual within that warehouse who found the most efficient ergonomic uh, method of picking up an object. Uh, it just gets, you know, spat back out to everybody else in the warehouse as this is best practice and what you need to follow. Uh, I think that's a big problem in the context of so many spaces, not just the sort of, you know, intuitive creative industries that we think about in the context of IP or copyright or those kinds of questions. Yeah, legally, from uh, uh, from the perspective of generative AI companies, they are arguing that it's fair use when they use all kinds of things for their training. And so far, they have actually pretty much prevailed in courts. Uh, and we'll, we'll still have to see how this all pans out. Uh, but of course, uh, from an ethical perspective and from a systems perspective, I very much agree with Stephanie that we want to design a system and we want our system uh, to provide fair compensation for workers. And if we take an even bigger picture perspective, I guess you can say that um, all this output of generative AI systems 
has ultimately been trained uh, on our collective human culture, on everything that we as humanity have ever produced. And from that perspective, I think that there is a pretty good case to be made. Uh, and Duncan uh, hinted at this earlier in his remarks, uh, that as these systems become better and better, and if they lead really to more significant disruptions, uh, that some of the surplus that they are producing should be distributed to society more broadly uh, in the form, for example, of a universal basic income or something along these lines. Um, because otherwise, uh, we would just have more and more of the benefits going to the few and uh, shared prosperity would suffer. Exactly on this note, uh, I think that the crucial question is uh, how much competition there is uh, between AI companies, right? So right now, it seems to be the case, this case that only a handful of companies are uh, have enough computing power to train uh, foundation models. And uh, But do you expect uh, this uh, industry to remain concentrated or do you expect new players to enter this market and this market to become more competitive? And so, uh, Anton, I know you have a, a recent paper on this topic. What are the trade-offs uh, that we need to think about in the context of how much competition there is uh, between uh, AI companies and how uh, many yeah. we have them? Mm -hmm. uh, but we came out uh, with a, a Brookings report uh, that's entitled Market Concentration Implications of these foundation models, which are the AI models underlying generative AI. And what we argue is that uh, the amount of resources that we need to put into this system is growing so rapidly uh, that only very few companies are able uh, to afford to participate kind of in the first tier. And uh, that means that the market for these systems uh, right now already is very concentrated. Uh, there are essentially two or three labs uh, that really have a leading position uh, in uh, top uh, frontier AI systems. Uh, and it will become more and more difficult for others uh, to catch up as the investment requirements here are doubling every six months. And um, as these AI systems are becoming more capable, uh, we are also anticipating that they will be used in a growing sector, growing number of sectors of the economy. So that means uh, their use cases are going to multiply and the market power that these companies have right now in the provision of just language models uh, may also extend to other sectors in which language models become the primary input. So um, we discussed before, it's hard to predict which exact sectors that are going to be. But imagine, for example, if the legal profession is going to be run primarily by language models in five years from now, uh, I have no idea if that's actually going to happen. But in that case, there is the risk uh, that uh, if we have just let's say two companies dominating that market, uh, that other sectors of the economy will also become more and more concentrated. And uh, that really calls uh, for the proper antitrust response. And uh, in particular, what we are arguing is, uh, so th these companies, they have kind of earned a leading position in the market for foundation models, for large language models like ChatGPT, uh, but we have to really watch out that they're not expanding their monopoly into other sectors that are using these models. And so, yeah. the, go ahead, Stephanie. Mind if I chip in with a, a couple of additional dynamics here? Uh, so I think one of the possible alternatives here is what's being considered by, for instance, the United States government and also in the UK, thinking about how do we create sort of national AI uh, sort of research resources. 
you know, how do we democratize compute basically uh, and make it possible for researchers at universities or startups or things like that uh, to be able to rival uh, some of the, you know, tremendous compute power that is enabling the dynamics that Anton was just talking about. Uh, and I think in order for that to actually pose a challenge that has to scale up robustly and quickly in a very short period of time, uh, which, you know, may or may not be an overly optimistic view. Um, it does, I think, create the possibility, though, for um, kind of alternative dynamics of AI development to be able to have these resources available to researchers who aren't interested in sort of driving towards products that are going to deliver shareholder value and instead are trying to think about things from a, you know, what would a community driven AI perspective look like? How do we create resources that address social problems that we're particularly concerned with, those kinds of things? So to be determined whether that creates any kind of a competitive challenge to what Anton just described, but does create, I think, some hope in terms of new AI products that are, you know, very clearly socially beneficial and developed by the communities who would be using them. Um, I think the second thing to throw out here is the degree to which uh, the next turn in AI becomes kind of what's what's termed AI agents, uh, which basically pulls the rug out from under every company that is thinking about the application layer right now. Uh, the industry currently has, you know, as Anton's talking about, a highly concentrated number of AI developed, like sort of frontier or foundation model developers uh, in many startups that are creating applications using uh, those models through API access or things like that. Uh, in the event that these systems become powerful enough to be agents on their own, where you don't have to have an application interme intermediary, where they become their own platform, uh, you end up with a very different, you know, an even more concentrated industry dynamic in terms of where are the revenues and gains of this latest technological boom coming from and where are they going. Uh, that puts even more power and even more money in the hands of the model providers relative to the dynamic that we even see currently. Uh, so that's something to, to absolutely be on the lookout for as, you know, the technologies continue to progress. Uh, not to knock on the concept of agents themselves, I think that it'd actually be pretty exciting to have something that's that powerful to work with in some ways, but plenty of other dynamics to consider there too. I see. So one solution uh, that I've seen thrown out there is uh, the open source software, right? So in principle, is a solution to democratize access to AI. At the same time, I heard there is a ton of concern regarding the safety of uh, open source software and uh, compared to proprietary software. And Anton, uh, once again, I know you have a recent papers on this topic. And uh, how do we, how can we think about it? So are open source software uh, in this uh, context even uh, close to being uh, um, competitive to the proprietary software? Do you expect this to change in the future? And would we want as a society to have uh, open, soft, open source software to become more and more prominent or do we want instead to uh, constrain or limit its applicability to certain areas? Uh, yeah, th this is from another paper now. Uh, it's a coalition paper uh, of uh, roughly two dozen authors uh, and it's entitled Open Sourcing Highly Capable Foundation Models. Uh, and uh, we essentially analyze precisely the two concerns uh, that you have laid out, Alberto that on the one hand, there are these really massive economic benefits from open sourcing, and they are uh, kind of parallel to this solution that Stephanie laid out before, that we just create public versions, pu public uh, uh, foundation models uh, that deliver all the benefits uh, that we currently derive from, let's say, a GPT-4. And, uh, you know, as, as somebody who was really a fierce open source advocate uh, in the 1990s when I was a programmer, uh, I very much sympathize with that. And as an economist, there are very strong and clear economic benefits. Uh, but on the other hand, I also do agree that as these systems become more powerful, uh, that there are growing safety risks. And uh, these two objectives of kind of distributing the benefits and ensuring that these systems are safe, uh, they are coming head to head with each other. So maybe that's where a public system like what Stephanie uh, advocated uh, would actually be able uh, to allow us to get the best of both worlds. Um, I unfortunately just uh, can't see it happen right now. Uh, so I, I just... Uh, heard that there were uh, rumors uh, 
in the last couple of days uh, that OpenAI is actively working on GPT-5, now the next uh, big uh, foundation model. And they just got $10 billion from Microsoft in January. They're looking for more funding because apparently it's so expensive to uh, produce uh, these systems. And things are also moving so fast that I think uh, at least in our uh, current institutional framework, it's really hard for governments uh, to keep up with this. So I hope that uh, maybe at some point uh, we can pursue what Stephanie proposed, but I don't see it right now. And in terms of the open sourcing now specifically, uh, I think right now we are in this situation where uh, the leading open source or quasi open source model uh, which is produced by Meta, and it's called Llama 2, uh, is pretty capable. And fortunately, it probably does not pose any safety risks. Uh, so I'm not too concerned about it being open sourced. Uh, but I think going forward, if these systems become one or two more orders of magnitude more capable, uh, then I would be more and more concerned if they're open sourced because that also allows programmers to get around any safety precautions and to use this highly capable intelligence for any purposes they want, including potentially nefarious purposes. Yeah, and the question of, of open source and safety is such an important one at this moment. Um, we just released a partnership on AI, uh, guidance on safe foundation model deployment, uh, which was led under the development of my colleague Madhu Shrikumar, uh, and in collaboration with a multi-stakeholder group uh, made up of civil society, academia, as well as industry, thinking through basically a threat assessment on the AI landscape and the different attributes that are most relevant to setting up guardrails uh, to ensure that the model is safe. Uh, and the openness of the system is absolutely one of them. Uh, the group, uh, and this is available for public comment, we'd be curious to hear everybody's thoughts, uh, but the initial recommendation is that uh, things that are at the absolute frontier of AI development should not be released in a completely open fashion, in part because it's very difficult to determine uh, and have confidence in the risk and the threat assessment uh, without having had the opportunity to sort of see those in a more closed environment where there's higher opportunities to control and set up those guardrails. Uh, that's something that, you know, is a contentious stance, and we recognize that, but it seems like the most prudent one at our current moment. But again, open to feedback and, and like, very excited to hear people's thoughts on that. And I, I know we're getting towards uh, the the end uh, of the time allotted to us, but one of the kind of uh, statements that Anton uh, kind of uh, made at the end of his uh, kind of uh, uh, first set of remarks was that we should be kind of given the the speed and the uncertainty uh, of uh, this uh, AI development, we should be getting ready for everything, right? So we should be open and try to be um, kind of uh, ready for all the possible uh, eventualities. But uh, at the individual level, so how do individuals can keep up to date? Like, do you think that the solutions of uh, this uh, uh, life learn, uh, lifelong learning is going to be uh, something that the private sector corporations are going to be helping, like Coursera, for example, or this other website, or is this something that the government should step in and provide uh, upskilling solutions, upskilling progr programs, or is this instead the responsibility of individual companies? How do you think that this reskilling, upskilling, and keeping uh, workers up to date with new technologies, how do you think that is going to occur, or how do you think it should occur? I mean, my absolute pipe dream on this would be the idea of something that's closer to the Swedish system, where there's a high level of coordination between industry and organized labor to ensure that workers who need to transition to new sets of skills and potentially entirely new occupations or industry as a result of economic dynamism uh, are fully supported in that transition. And it's done in a fashion that both supports industry needs as well as the needs of, of individual workers. Uh, in this country, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Uh, we have, I think, comparatively minimal protections for workers who find themselves on the wrong end of the skills dynamic as a result of technological change. Uh, I would love to see more robust social safety nets to support those folks. I would love to see more on-site training programs 
I'd love to see the higher expectations for companies that put workers out of work. Uh, we see higher and lower levels depending on the state that you're talking about in the US. Uh, but I think we can afford to raise the bar, uh, especially in a, a time where supposedly th these systems are all going to create tremendous surplus for all of us economically. Uh, we should be reinvesting that in people's livelihoods, especially the people who are most likely to catch the downsides, most likely to be you know, susceptible to some of the biggest economic harms. Uh, I agree with Stephanie, uh, but I also think we kind of need to question the word continuous upskilling, uh, because in some ways that was the most appropriate thing to do in the past four decades. In the past four decades, it's true that we automated simpler uh, tasks and people could always move into higher skilled tasks. But now we have these AI systems that are suddenly automating the cognitive tasks and in fact, uh, I expect that we will have uh, we will have a reallocation of people from white collar to blue collar jobs. Uh, we need more of those trade skills. So in that sense, reskilling is probably much more appropriate. And then ultimately, if one of the really more transformative scenarios plays out, uh, like for example, AI that can do essentially all work tasks uh, in I don't know, 10 years from now, then I think we will also really need to rely to a very important extent on public solutions, uh, solutions like uh, systems that will provide income to people aside from the labor market, because we won't be able to rely uh, on work income alone in such a world without experiencing massive poverty. Well, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful discussion, Stefan and Anton. Let me take a moment to uh, thank uh, the entire Brookings team for this uh, fantastic event. And uh, to the audience, thank you so much for tuning in and have a great continuation of your day.